Thank you, Marnie. Welcome, everyone, to the 2012 Venture Forum. Superior Group is a Buffalo-based global provider of workforce and business solutions. We've had the opportunity to work with many emerging companies in the high-tech sectors that are represented today. If you'd like to know more about our organization and how we can enable the success of your company or the companies in which you invest, please feel free to seek me out or any of my associates who will be here at the forum throughout the day. Upstate New York and Southern Ontario have a strong legacy of innovation. We firmly believe that this forum brings that legacy forward to today's economy. So that said, let's get started and work together to see if we can make the entrepreneurial and the investor stars align. Our first presenter is Don Stewart, CEO of Plantform Corporation. Every year in the United States, 300,000 women are diagnosed with breast cancer. Our company is focused on providing low-cost therapies of existing drugs. And at this forum, we're seeking uh, investors in a $2 million bridge. We're uh, seeking both funds and angel investments with a minimum of $25,000 at 75 cents a share. Oh, I went the wrong way, I guess. Here we go. But breast cancer is a very significant problem, and one of the most um, effective drugs in uh, about 30% of the people who have breast cancer, it's men and women actually, is a drug called uh, Herceptin. It's manufactured by Roche, and it's coming off patent in Europe in 2015, 2016, and um, in the United States here in 2017, 2018. And uh, we have uh, developed a uh, manufacturing system that's ultra low cost based on using tobacco plants. Um, this is technology from the University of Guelph, just across the border, uh, an hour and a half north, where we're located our lab, and uh, we also have facilities in Sarnia and in Toronto. The drug itself sells uh, about $6 billion last year worldwide. Um, it's expected to increase to about uh, $7.4 billion. And we anticipate that the market for the generic or the biosimilar portion of this is about $2 billion. And uh, we aim to capture at least 50% of that market. We're developing other cancer drugs as well. We've started working on a biosimilar Avastin, which is a $9 billion market, and uh, Herbitux as well, which is about a $2 billion market. Um, last December, we received an award from the Gates Foundation to uh, start developing antibody drugs for HIV AIDS with a view to, in the long term, um, setting up manufacturing in sub-Saharan Africa. And it would be our intention as a company to uh, set up manufacturing in the United States. We're currently using a contract site in Kentucky, and uh, we're beginning to look at other states, including New York, as a location for the next stage of the development of our company. What happens with this technology is you grow tobacco plants for about six weeks, and at that point you introduce the gene into them using an agrobacterium, and uh, a week later you harvest the plants just by cutting them down, and from that you extract the antibody drugs using uh, standard uh, food processing as the first stage, and then standard manufacturing as it's done uh, in the currently in the pharmaceutical industry. The plants have been, there's been two major problems with the use of plants as a production system for drugs. Um, one of them was yields of recombinant drugs, which were quite low. And this new technology has uh, overcome that problem. And the second problem is that plants actually produce non-human type, non-mammalian type sugars on the surface. They decorate drugs in a way which could create adverse effects. There's been technology developed now uh, in our lab and also at the University of Vienna where that problem is resolved. So the use of plants now, and you'll see also some candidates that are moving through clinical trials and have been approved by FDA. We're now poised at the point to take advantage of this low-cost manufacturing approach. So what we've done as a company is we um, have uh, established a process for producing Herceptin, biosimilar Herceptin, in our tobacco. 
We've transferred that process to Kentucky Bioprocessing in Owensboro, Kentucky, and scaled the process to a commercial scale. And from those materials, we're now testing and evaluating in animal models. Um, this is my one data slide. It shows um, a test where we've got breast cancer cells growing in the lab, and we're looking at the effect of uh, Herceptin and our biosimilar Herceptin uh, in killing the cancer cells growing in the Petri dishes. And you can see that the blue and the green curves fall right on top of each other. Those are our drugs and the name brand drugs, and they have exactly equivalent activity. This was a very exciting result to us as we were moving the project forward. So this is the play here from uh, the uh, cost of goods, is uh, where our major play is in terms of using plants as opposed to the current mammalian production systems for these type of antibody drugs. Uh, Herceptin costs $3,500 a vial, and the course of treatment varies between forty dollars and $100,000 a year. So it's a very significant burden on healthcare systems. With our system, which is shown on the right nearest, uh, yeah, the right nearest me, um, you can see that our cost of goods is 10% of the cost of goods of using standard manufacturing. This gives us a very significant advantage in being able to uh, reduce the price of the drug itself in the market. Um, we can come down to 50% or less uh, compared to the name brand drug. Now, there are competitors using standard manufacturing processes to uh, produce other biosimilar versions of this drug. They're all using standard mammalian processing, and uh, their cost of goods is similar to the originator name brand. So we have a very significant advantage here and we'll be able to compete on price and also on quality of our product. A second advantage is the uh, cost of a facility. Um, on uh, the greenhouse there is Kentucky Bioprocessing's facility. It's completely contained. There's no environmental contamination coming in, nothing going out into the environment. Um, and uh, the cost of a facility like that is about $42 million to uh, create a um, billion dollars worth of Herceptin, which is our objective. That compares to about 200 to $250 million for a typical mammalian and fermentation plant. So the reason that we chose, one of the reasons we chose to work on biosimilar drugs is that the cost of developing a drug is significantly less, and the timeline is significantly less than an innovator drug. You can see here on the top the development timeline for a typical innovator drug is 12 to 18 years, and uh, any number from 500 million to 3 billion is the numbers quoted by Big Pharma. Um, our, our program is uh, five to six years. Um, we're in the preclinical stage at the moment, and the significant cost reductions come from the much reduced clinical trials. FDA do require phase three clinical trials. No phase two trial is required, but our phase three trial will be 350 patients, and um, uh, that compares to 4,000 patients, which was the trial for the originator. So our clinical trial costs are in the order of uh, 55, 56 million. The, uh, are a number of these biosimilar drugs approved? In the states here, there are two drugs which were approved by existing legislation. Um, acritropin is a human growth hormone that I worked on at Kanjin Corporation, where I was the director of uh, research and development for 20 years. It's a, a biotechnology company in uh, Winnipeg, and uh, in, at that time in Mississauga, near Toronto. Um, these other drugs are EPOs, human growth hormones, and GCSFs approved in Europe, and they all enter the market at 70 to 80 percent of the name brand price. Um, our approach as a company is to be a development company. We're licensing in technology from the University of Guelph and from NIH and Duke University, and we are bringing in a marketing partner who will support the clinical trial program and be our distribution and sales partner. We've identified three um, different uh, types of partners that we are approaching, and we are, have got ongoing discussions for investment and partnership deals with candidates in each of these uh, three boxes here. In terms of competition, we are aware of uh, four or five other drugs in development. As I mentioned, none of them are using low-cost, uh, low-capital facilities. So we are in a very unique space here. Um, there are other uh, companies producing drugs in a similar way in, um, in plants. The lead one has just been licensed by the FDA. It's a uh, Protalix have been developing a biosimilar version of Sarazyme, which is the Boston-based Genzymes company's um, 
Gaucher's disease drug. They have a partnership deal with uh, Pfizer, and um, uh, it's a very good case for us because they're using a plant-based system to produce a biosimilar drug, and they have been approved uh, by the FDA, actually, on the 1st of May. Um, other drugs in development by uh, European um, uh, North American companies, uh, in, in a number in clinicals and a larger number in preclinical development at the moment. We are aware of two other companies who have now started working in the biosimilar space. Uh, we're four years ahead of them, and uh, we know that we're not working on the same candidates as any of the other uh, plant-based companies working in the biosimilar space. So as a company we set up in 2008, uh, it's technology from the University of Guelph, from Dr. Chris Hall's lab. Uh, we've raised 1.5 million from angels. We have about 45 investors, a small fund who's invested. They're actually, uh, um, have just set up our own company called RNA Diagnostics, you're here. And uh, we're moving towards clinicals. We have three families of patents. We have a strong team, uh, a board with recognized names. And uh, we expect to be revenue positive in 2016. Project cost of 60 million, and we're currently in the second round of angel investment here. Uh, we have defined endpoints, and we have an exit in uh, 2013, and uh, also an exit in 2015 for the early stage investor. Um, we're looking to make a partnership deal with Big Pharma, as I mentioned, to, uh, and so a total investment of about 35 million from angels and venture capital funds and very high net worth individuals. So that's our story. Uh, we're very excited to be here, and uh, we'll be over on this side here, and uh, myself and David Kayer, our business development manager, would be very pleased to speak to you uh, about our company and uh, the type of initiatives we could set up here in upstate New York. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Don. Our next presenter is Jeff Morin, founder and CEO of Top Quality Hay Producers. Excuse me, Top Quality Hay Processors. Good morning, I'm very excited to be here. My name is Jeff Warren, I'm founder and CEO of Top Quality Hay Processors. We produce the best animal feed in the world. There we go. Uh, our products are all natural, 100%. There are, there are no additives, there are no preservatives, and all of our products have two to three times the, the nutrients of the traditional products. Uh, it's a, in the U.S. market size is $23.7 billion. Our revenues in 2011 were roughly $400,000. After our capital raise within 12 months, we'll be at $4.7 million. The demand for our product far exceeds our, cap our capacity to produce. Uh, we were in tractor supply in 2010 and 2011, and we had to pull out because we couldn't keep up with the demand. We had a great relationship with tractor supply, so we exited gracefully, and they want us to come back as soon as we can uh, supply the demand of 244 stores. Tractor supply is a national chain with over 1,000 stores. So in 2013, we plan on being back into tractor supply. Uh, there's a shortage of, the problem is there's a shortage of quality forage in the U.S. and worldwide. Uh, Blumberg and uh, New York Times all talk about it's the weather, the competition from other crops such as corn and soybeans and, um, excuse me, so the, the weather plays a havoc with this crop. Uh, we produce an all-natural na animal feed, U.S. market size. Is the, the size is $23.7 billion, uh, of which equine and forage is $4.3 billion of that $23 billion. Uh, for dairy goats, alpacas, sheep, and llamas, it's a $1.8 billion market. One drying line of top quality hay process will produce $9 million. Within two to four years, we expect to have two drying lines at $18 million. Uh, you can see it's just a drop in the bucket of the national need. Uh, the current process, to understand, forage has been around for thousands of years with very few changes over the time period. Basically, to give you a, little, a quick background, first you go out and you cut the forage. The next day you go out with a machine called a tether and you spread it all over to get more surface to air exposure, more sun exposure to help it dry. The following day you go in with a machine called a rake and you rake it up into a windrow. The next day you go back out with that rake and you tip what's over on the bottoms now on the top to let it dry. The following 
following day you go with a machine called a baler, you bale the hay, then you pick it up and you move it to storage. This process takes four and a half to five rain-free, low humidity days. If it rains during this process, the crop is ruined, becomes like mulch. Our game-changing technology here eliminates all the process in the field except the first. What we do is we go out with our equipment, we cut the hay, it never touches the ground. It goes into the walking floor trailers, comes back to our facilities where it's unloaded, it's dried, it's baled, and it's ready for shipment in under four hours instead of four and a half to five days. We operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week, rain or shine. This, this is a game-changing technology. It's going to be like Cyrus McCormick's Reaper did for grains. This is going to change the way um, forage is harvested in U.S., Canada, and around the world. The, the game-changing uh, technology, the process, we've taken from four and a half to five rain-free low humidity days, moved it down to less than four hours. We, we get a minimum of 40% more yield per acre during this, over the season. Uh, it's always highly nutritious. It's consistent. It, it's contaminant-free 100% of the time. The, one of the best things about this product is it's always consistent from one delivery to the next delivery, and that's the biggest problem with forage out there. Uh, it, we eliminate contaminants because it's not laying on the ground, being turned and, and raked and tedded and then baled. There's no sticks, there's no stones, and most importantly, there's no dust and dirt in our product. We have several products. Our first product is our baled hay product. We have three types. We have alfalfa, orchard grass, alfalfa, and timothy. We have a small animal feed for rabbits, gerbils, hamsters, guinea pigs, mice, and more. Uh, we have three varieties, a timothy, an, alf an orchard grass alfalfa, and also an alfalfa. We have an alfalfa accents product. This was developed by our customers. It is a top dressing for lower quality feeds and hays. And we have nuzzle sprouts, which is a holistic approach to the well-being of the animals. We have three varieties, we have three formulations. We have general wellness, uh, anti-inflammatory, and respiratory. These are our current product line, and we have several future products. Top quality hay, the, the competition. Currently, hay is grown everywhere from here to Oregon to Texas, up in Canada. The problem is it's inconsistent. Every time you cut hay, what happens? It seems to rain, which then makes a poor quality hay product. So we now have a product that's consistent every time. Um, it's reliable. Uh, our product is, is um, heated at 250 degrees, which kills all the pathogens that can live in other animal hays and feed. So it's a very safe product. Our specialty products, there's no other products like it on the market because these come as byproducts from our main product. Uh, the channels of, of uh, channels to market, in 2011, fourth quarter, we established um, distribution in 120 stores in 16 states, we're as far south as Virginia, as west as Illinois, as north as Maine. Uh, the future, as soon as we have our drying line in, we'll be back in uh, tractor supply storage. It's roughly a $3 million contract with them. Uh, in the future, franchising. These facilities need to be every place that hay is grown and it rains, which is from here to Oregon, down to Texas, and north of the border, and international. We've had over 80 groups come into our facility very excited about doing franchising or some type of licensing agreement. We've also had groups from 15 different nations. Uh, in India, for example, they're still cutting hay with a sickle bar. So this is a great way to skip the 19th century and go to the 21st century. Uh, these facilities, again, need to be located in U.S., Canada, and international. Uh, these are our sales sales going. Our pilot line is 1.7 projected in 2012, in 2013, 4.5. And the big jump to 2014 when we added another line is the fact that half the production from 2013 is being sold in 2014. Uh, top quality hay, what we're looking for is $5 million investment to establish a new drying line. Uh, the equipment is $4.3 million. Marketing and operating expense is roughly four point, is another uh, $1.7 million. We'll be cash positive by the end of the 12th month of receiving the funding. Uh, the four-year projected net cash flow is over $22 million. We've been approved by a NYSERDA grant for $1.75 million. We take the weather out of farming. 
Uh, please see me afterwards for testimonials. One exciting thing about this process is getting the testimonials from the, the end users, the animal owners, how they notice a difference in their animals. Animals with respiratory issues do extremely well on our products. Everybody notices a, a contentment difference when you have an all natural product. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. Please join me in welcoming our next presenter, Christine Montag, co-founder and CEO of Ladybug Technologies. Hi, I'm Chris Montag from Ladybug Technologies. Um, we have built the um, first of its kind private kiosk network integrating the latest in breathalyzer, mobile and vending technology to create a game-changing solution for the hospitality industry. We started in the early days um, actually selling a law enforcement breathalyzer um, to the consumer market at a price point of $1,000. The cost was very prohibitive to uh, generate a large amount of revenue. So we got creative and um, created training programs and various event services until eventually we partnered with LifeLock in 2010 where we were able to bring the right price consumer market um, introducing the concept of charting. Uh, we then developed a software app introducing Time to Zero and today we bring all of those technologies and services together and we built three prototype units of the SipSmart kiosk. We are seeking $500,000 to commercialize the kiosk solution. My background, I've worked for various high-tech startups as well as um, turnarounds very closely with the investors involved. Um, we are building a very strong advisory team. Um, today we are courting Harvey Carroll, president of GRIP, an external marketing company for Labatt's out of Toronto. Um, his formal position, he was the lead for the internal Labatt's marketing group. Greg Alexanian, um, sales marketing guru who has brought technology into the hospitality industry in the past, is very well aligned to join Ladybug's management team. Gary Walters, Starburst Coin, uh, coin vending giant in Canada, has operations in Texas as well. Um, other strategic alliances such as um, designated drivers, um, elite taxi service, among others. Uh, today, the alcohol beverage industry is a multi-billion dollar industry. Hospitality industry, including bars, restaurants, nightclubs, country clubs, stadiums, is the largest growing industry worldwide, employing one out of ten people. Legislation around drinking and driving continues to become more harsh. We overlay that with 205 million social drinkers in North America alone. The challenge is, how do we continue to support these thriving industries, um, meet or give social drinkers the freedom of choice and still make our communities a safe place to live. The solution, the SipSmart kiosk. We've brought technology that we've always sold to breathalyzer, packaged it differently into a multi-service kiosk. If you're the patron in the bar, you can test your blood alcohol level, order a taxi cab, print a coupon for a nearby venue. If you're the bar or restaurant, you can advertise upcoming events, your services, offer coupons to your customers. If you are the hotel, it really acts as a multi-service uh, concierge. Of the 205 million social drinkers, 42 million are considered to be moderate and heavy drinkers. That means that they consume at least three drinks at one sitting more than once a week. Overlay that with provinces and states with harsh drinking and driving legislation, we get to an immediate accessible market of 22 million drinkers. Um, I believe because of the multiple services that we've built into the kiosk, we will also attract non-drinkers to the system. Um, our latest product, as of the last three or four weeks, um, a single-use breathalyzer tube. Um, it's inexpensive, one-time use. Uh, it's a great way to build brand awareness. It can be retailed, um, co-branded for a promotional giveaway, and hopefully in every box of beer. We will go to market with the kiosk through the coin vending distributors, um, Starburst Coin, American Vending out of Chicago. These guys already have relationships in place with the large bar restaurant chains. We'll also attend franchise and business opportunity shows, as well as country club specific association shows, and work closely with our strategic partners such as designated drivers. Today our handheld unit is sold mostly through our largest reseller, Alcohol Prevention out of Quebec. 
um, Costco Canada online, and our latest to join designated drivers. Um, we also have our own online storefront, and once we gain critical mass with the kiosk, um, the kiosk will become a, a large marketing tool of the handheld product. We have competition for um, both product lines. Um, with our handheld unit, we partner with two of the top three law enforcement manufacturers, have the ability to sell their product in addition to our back tracker. Um, the kiosk, Elko Lab, um, is manufactured in Toronto. Um, it is a wall-hung single-use breathalyzer machine in Toxbox, latest to the market within the last two years. Um, they're the simil most similar business model. Their challenge from a technology perspective um, is they're building components of a breathalyzer into their box, where, as, whereas we have brought an actual law enforcement breathalyzer built into our machine. Um, our slim line design will allow us to go into any market so we can be placed in a upscale dining establishment as well as the hotel lobby and eventually we can adapt the software to workplace safety and public transportation system in tox boxes really limiting themselves to a bar nightclub scene. The value proposition, depending on which stakeholder group you are in, is different. If you're the hospitality industry and you happen to be located in a province or state with high drinking and driving legislation, you've probably um, experienced a drop in revenue up to 30%. We believe by putting the kiosk on premise, it will help increase revenue, increase foot traffic, um, making their venues again social yet responsible. If you're one of the social drinkers, you can be out um, socially drinking, test your blood alcohol level and enjoy other services from the system. If you're the alcohol beverage industry, uh, we really are creating a new platform for you to be able to spend your social responsibility marketing dollars. It's a win-win for all stakeholders. Um, these large industries continue to thrive, uh, social drinkers continue to have freedom of choice, and our communities become safer. Um, the disposable breathalyzer tube um, will enjoy between 36 to 50 percent gross margin depending on how it's sold. The handheld unit currently retails for 269, 45 percent gross margin when sold direct. Um, the kiosk will wholesale for 7,500, 33 percent gross margin. Both the handheld and the kiosk have recurring revenue streams. The kiosk will remain the largest revenue generator for Ladybug. Um, as we gain critical mass with the machines, the advertising um, becomes extremely lucrative. Based on what we know about the current coin vending business today, um, we anticipate a six to eight month payback on these machines. Um, the idea really is building in the multi-services into the kiosk, um, creating a larger user footprint, and essentially a reverse ATM. So for every transaction or service provided on the machine, revenue is earned. Um, these little guys are actually also very lucrative um, when you consider volume. Um, my counterpart in Montreal shipped four million of these a month ago. If he made only 25 cents, that's a million dollars in margin. Today we are currently seeking $500,000 to further develop the technology on the kiosk to go back out into pilot with a larger scale 12 units. Um, 10 in partnership with Starburst Coin in 10 different large bar restaurant chains, five on each side of the border. One in partnership with designated drivers in a local country club and one in the Niagara Hilton Falls View Hotel. Um, we need to trademark our SipSmart brand, which has become more important now that we've got this little guy, um, rebrand the handheld unit, build the back-end system, and move to full commercialization and rollout. $500,000 will get you one-third equity in Ladybug. From an ex exit, um, it could potentially be one of the large coin vending gurus, Coinstar, Redbox, has set up a merger acquisition as well as an investment group. Touchtunes is today's modernized jukebox. They have a very similar business model to ours, um, whereby there's multiple services, each for a transaction fee. Could be designated drivers or taxi magic. We are essentially creating a technology platform to order a taxi. Um, our, could be one of our law enforcement partners, LifeLock being the most likely. Um, they've been in the space for 25 years. Um, and are still only a six million annual revenue business. They recently went public looking to expand. Um, based on the advertising component, we are really building a private network of, of like-minded social drinkers, so it could be of interest um, to InBev. 
Uh, our secret sauce, we've got a proprietary logarithm with the, the app. Um, the SitSmart so kiosk uh, business methodology patent is underway and we have strong branding that is recognized by the main stakeholder groups. Um, I believe we've created a disruptive social solution which potentially could be revolutionary. We are supporting our largest industries, um, we are improving the lives of social drinkers and making our communities safer at the same time. Thank you, Christine. Our next presenter is Robert Cessna, Director of Product Development at iMusic. Sure, this thing's going the right way. All right. Hi, my name is Robert Gender Cessna. Now, I've been playing music for my entire life, so I can tell you guys that the most frustrating thing for a beginner to even the most advanced musician is having to deal with the hassle of paper sheet music. It is just beyond frustrating having to focus on turning the page when you should actually be concentrating on playing the music. So that is why we have created the My Music Stand. It's a touchscreen digital music stand that eliminates the need for paper sheet music. The My Music Stand stores all of your songs right on the device and then it displays the score digitally on the screen. And most importantly, when it comes time to playing, the My Music Stand has hands-free page turning so you can concentrate on what's really important. So I'm sure most of you are now thinking, why not use an iPad? Well, as much as I love this thing, the answer to that is simple. Musicians, they don't recognize, they don't recognize individual notes. They read ahead in the sheet music. They recognize patterns. So unless you're playing a one-page piece of music, it's kind of useless. As you can see, as you can see it's, it's a ton smaller than a two full page spread of sheet music as a normal musician would use. Now, we have identified our four main target markets, professional, institutional, religious, and individual. We are in talks with the leading established distributor for two of our main market segments, institutional and chorus, and religious. These markets combine in at a total of 300 million annually. We are well underway in talks with the largest distributor when it comes to um, selling to music schools and universities. Now, Majuzik is a software company located in Krakow, Poland. They sell their software to schools throughout Europe and many countries in the European Union. They also write grant proposals to, for the schools if the schools are not able to afford these products with a very high approval rating. My Majuzik has sent us a contract for the sole distribution rights to the countries of Poland and Germany for the next three consecutive years to the My Musik stand. Now, when I started off my software development, it was very hard for me to find the right company to work with us. It was very hard to even get a company to work with me. I heard everything from $50,000 to $500,000. Software companies, they value your project and what they think it's worth. So what I did instead was I host, hosted an event in Syracuse Technology Garden in collaboration with the Syracuse Innovators Guild called Hacking for Music. We called for programmers, graphic designers, musicians. It was 54 hours of nonstop coding. These people that showed up, they were all musicians and graphic designers. It, was, it worked out better than me going out and searching for a company because these people, they showed up to integrate music with technology. They weren't hired to. It was the ultimate method of recruitment for us and a milestone weekend in our software development. We have one more picture coming. I separated the participants into teams. Uh, these participants, they worked on different aspects and innovative solutions to the My Music software. We continued with our software development and many of the members actually stayed on and have continued work with us. Now, our vision is to become known and regarded as the iTunes of sheet music. Um, the laws on sheet music are very similar to those on artwork, meaning they have copyrights. But the thing most people don't know is anything written before roughly about 1950 is classified as public domain sheet music, meaning it's free. 
uh, we're starting our archive with 177,000 scores through our collaboration with the International Music Score, International Music Score Library Project, which was, which was started in 2006 by a Harvard Law student. Our library is growing at a rate of 3,000 weekly. We intend to secure agreements with larger publishing houses to expand our copyright material to become known and regarded as the iTunes of sheet music. This allows you to download music directly to the stand from our website through a wireless connection. It, you're able to organize your own sheet music library and this, the building and maintaining of our securing, publishing house agree, securing agreements through publishing houses will enable us to continue with our software development and continue with providing sheet music to the musician directly to the stand. Now, our management team has been through setting up strategic partnerships with leaders in each industry. Our hardware manufacturing, we have a low cost price point uh, that gives us a very competitive advantage. Assembly, assembly, packaging, and shipping is all done through this relationship. Our legal is handled by Harris Beach, my legal and patent. My provisional patent was filed over a year ago, and we are in, Harris Beach is now working on a full-fledged patent to be filed with the uh, PTO and European Patent Office. Our Bowers, or our accounting, is also through a local Syracuse firm, Bowers. Uh, I have aligned my company with CEO Ventures, which is a business acceleration program. We have also brought on a seasoned mentor as well as a seasoned entrepreneur as our interim CEO. He ma also manages a private equity fund. These advisors and mentors will help us in boarding the key personnel we need to ma effectively manage our growing operational needs. Now, our, the uses for our funding is to get us through beta, te beta testing. We need to buy prototypes, uh, can work on our marketing and SEO development, data and continue by securing and continue our software or continue our sheet music archive, building of our sheet music archive through securing these agreements with these publishing, publishing houses. The 50,000 or the 100,000 will get us through beta testing. Now once revenue begins, we will begin the A round capital raise to move this business into the next phase of development and begin development of their website database, increasing our inventory of sheet music, as I've said a couple times, to be regarded as the iTunes of sheet music. This seed round proves concept, starts sales, and validates our software. The A round will follow shortly after. Our beta testing is going to be through members of the Syracuse University Orchestra. This will allow us to continue with our software development and focusing on the usability for the musician, because that's really what it's all about. The musicians, they're perfectionists. They have been doing what they've been doing for thousands of years. Most people say, why not just have the music scroll in front of them? Well, musicians, they would not accept such a thing. Annotating, it has to be very specific. They are perfectionists, basically. Now, we've been getting a lot of great press in, after our hackathon that we hosted at the Syracuse Technology Garden. Uh, Entrepreneur Magazine did an article on us, why and how to host a hackathon. We've been in the Central New York Business Journal. Uh, MSNBC, Syracuse Post Standard. I was actually had the privilege of flying to LA to be, uh, I recorded an episode of the most watched show on television when it comes to entrepreneurships and their startups. I'm under NDA and can't disclose, but I'm sure everybody can think of what show that is. <laughs> so basically, with your guys' help, we're looking to get the 100,000 to get us get those prototypes and get feedback from the musicians because like I said it's all about them and we want to be able to continue and by getting feedback from them to continue our software development. Uh, securing agreements with the publishing houses and um, continuation of our software development is the main uses for the seed funding. With your help we intend, to lies, we intend to finalize the beta testing, formally launch the company and complete our partnerships agreements and move aggressively towards securing, securing agreements with those publishing houses. Um, musicians, like I said, they do not like change. They do not want the music scrolling in front of them. They want it the same way it is, same way as they've done it for thousands of years. The My Music Stand does not change anything. We improve the life of the musician. Um, I welcome you guys to talk afterwards for investment opportunities. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Our next presenter is Sean Pedersen, CEO, Strongarm Technologies.
Hello everyone, I'm Sean Peterson. This is my partner, Justin Hillary, and we are Strong Arm Technologies, creators of wearable ergonomic solutions. Today I want to tell you about how over the last 18 months, Justin and I have lived and breathed this company, bringing our initial product, the Strong Arm Lifting Safety Vest, closer to the market. Justin and I are industrial design and entrepreneurship students at RIT. We are specifically there to create businesses based upon products that we develop. The product I'm about to tell you about is by far our most favorite venture yet because it hits closest to home. Coming from a construction background, Justin and I wanted to find a way to make the lives of construction workers easier and safer by teaching them how to live, by applying what we know in the gym to their everyday jobs. We did some research and it turns out that whether it's carrying packages for FedEx, moving boxes around a warehouse, or delivering materials around a factory, $50 billion is spent every year in compensating injuries for workers who are lifting incorrectly. At $8,500 an average claim, days off, decreased productivity, and in general, decreased quality of life, it's clear to see that there's an issue and there are no current quality solutions. So the issue right now is people are lifting incorrectly, bending over in a very common posture at the waist, and what it does is it makes the load of that package actually 15 times heavier than it actually is, greatly increasing the chance of someone hurting their lower back or back or back injury. So how do you get people to lift like that? These are some of the examples out there right now. Um, I know, this is really what's out there. This is what, to get the load off, off the user's arms and onto their body. So the first device you can see, it's a two-person device. There's clearly no um, industrious capability. The next one is a single-person device, but again, there's no back or body support. Actually, 15, uh, this, by having no lower body support, 700 times more targets applied to your lower lumbar, greatly increasing your chance of injury. And again, this one is the only OSHA-approved device. However, two-person device, and you're locked into that device. So if that package falls over, the last thing I worried about is lifting it correctly. Now, over there, the back belt or the back brace is the most common device you'll see. This is in every warehouse across the country. Now, the issue with it is, in 1991, 92, and 98, NIOSH has done a study that showed there's no quantitative data for this device to actually work. Now, in fact, by wearing this device all day, your muscles become dependent upon it, and they begin to atrophy. Therefore, when you take the brace home, then you take the brace off, go to pick up your kid at home or lift the package, you're 15 times more likely to throw at your back or body. Um, now, priced at $19 to $950, there's clearly room for innovation. Now, how do you get the people to lift correctly? Not like this, but like this. Bending at their knees, keeping the back straight, and what we call the NIOSH prescribed lifting posture. But how do you do it? The answer is the strong arm. The device that my partner Justin is wearing is an ergonomically designed system of cables that takes the injury causing loads from his weaker hands, arms, neck, and lower back and redistributes those loads to stronger, more stable areas of his torso. Now what you notice as Justin goes to pick up the package, the first thing is the straps are slightly shorter than the length of his arms, forcing him to bend at his knees. Next, as he picks up the package, it's engaged, forcing his hand into a natural grip. The loads then bypass all the fatigue muscles in his hands, forearms, biceps, and triceps, transfer over his shoulders and onto our system. So as the weight goes down, what it does is it pulls in on Justin's abdomen, applying posture correction and support to his lower lumbar, increasing abdominal pressure. Then as he travels up, it pulls back his shoulders, pushes in on his upper back, and it puts him in that proper, almost what we call a squat position. That's called the NIOSH prescribed lifting posture. So to get to this point, we've gone through, which now 17 prototype iterations. Um, we have two PCT files, and everything has been designed around this being cost effective and most importantly, wearable. That's the most important thing for us. We have one PCT um, on hold as well. We've also, in everything that we've patented, has been around multiple iterations. We've patented every possible way in which you can design this so that it effectively works to best protect ourselves from any infringement. So for validation, we've been validated by some of the leading ergonomists in, in the United States. Uh, Dr. Jeffrey Howe did an intensive study on us where he proved that we are the only device on the market that changes the dynamics of a lift. Meaning that for 40 years, this problem's been around, but it's a behavioral issue. There's been expensive equipment and expensive regimens, but no way to enforce it. The reason is, it's a behavioral issue. We are the only device that can actually put the people in our posture, therefore mitigating those costly injuries and increasing workers' productivity. So again, what we do is we put people in what we call lumbar flexion, not extension, and what that does is it puts them in the right posture, therefore mitigating the chance of slipping into this. So since day one, we've been constantly interacting with the end user, trying to figure out why they were, what they would do. Our most important feedback probably came from the Motorx. This is the largest materials handling conference in the United States. There we met leading Fortune 500 companies who are really who are going to be our first customers. Um, then we went to the Ergo Cup, where we met the leading ergonomists, leading physical therapists in the United States, who want to do, continue doing research studies on us, which is incredibly validating for us, and just inspiring to help us keep moving forward. 
Now, since all this positive response, we've been constantly receiving cold calls for companies that want to purchase our device. However, we're holding back, uh, staying true to our stage gate process, and we're only we're reeling those customers in as initial beta tests. So again, our business model is just that. We're reeling in our initial customers via beta tests and contract manufacturing locally. This actually keeps things really great for us, turnaround times and all that. So the beta tests are going to target 41,000 companies with 1,000 or more employees that are lifting materials. Now, the reason is this is the most efficient way to get to those 8.5 million workers that are lifting day in and day out. About 38 billion is spent every year in, in claims directly to uh, the employer, and then 50 billion is spent in comp claims for these guys. At about $8,500 an average claim, you can equip 24 strip, um, individuals with strong arm. So, um, for the beta test, these are the companies that we've so far uh, signed up. We're in a conversation with. Um, just to give you a scope of how this works, uh, Target, uh, we're going to start with them in July. And what they want to do is first a proof of concept where we do a small stage run, uh, get everyone influenced with the device. Then we move to a, a larger regional test um, later in the fall. And um, just to give you a scope of how this market works, Target has 1,800 stores, about 50 distribution centers, totaling about 42,000 workers that are lifting day in and day out that they need to equip with strong arm. Um, the companies we have listed here are under the same agreements uh, and, and the same schedule here. So again, our, for, our sales model is to start with these beta tests to reel in those initial companies, but we're not trying to build a sales force. Um, over the last uh, 18 months, we've been constantly working with uh, some of the leading distributors and leading uh, names in, the, in this industry, which we call the materials handling industry, to set up distribution channels through these target channels. So uh, first thing you'll notice uh, in line two, we have a recurring revenue stream. Uh, that's because all these customers we've been talking to, they want to see a two year lifespan on this. Uh, it's great for us because it has, provides a recurring revenue stream and it provides best value for them. Um, and then you notice the price. Uh, again, 19 to $950 is what we're looking at in, in terms of the, the competition. We're pricing ourselves advantageously in the middle, um, but still maintain large margins. Um, so what we're asking for is $200,000 in two tranches. The first $50,000 is just to continue on with these beta tests uh, with the customers I listed earlier, and the second $150,000 is to ramp up production for those larger regional tests with those customers. And all this is at a pre-money valuation of $1.3 million. So our team is overly qualified. Uh, we are from biomedical researchers to OSHA representatives. Um, our OSHA representative, Tracy Frias, uh, she is walking us through the 18-month process that is getting OSHA approval. And the materials handling industry, this is what is sort of like the good housekeeping home sale of approval. Now, as strong I move forward, uh, we're not a one-trick party. We do have other products. When we have the cash and means to do so, we're going to move forward. The first of which is a patient lifting device. Um, time and time again at these trade shows, we meet nurses who want to find a way to lift heavier patients. Uh, by leveraging core strong arm technology, we made an adaption that can lift patients in and out of chairs to reduce what is an even larger problem in the medical industry. Next is a licensing option. Um, earlier, I had mentioned Deke Jameson. He is the number one, he's our, basically a licensing mentor. Uh, he owns the number one selling pair of jeans in America, uh, YMI Jeans, and he's walking us through licensing because one of our barriers to entry is going to be logoization and existing contracts with existing garment manufacturers. So if Cintas has a 10-year agreement with uh, FedEx, we're able to actually embed our core technology into their garments so that we can provide an added value for them and a revenue stream for us. Um, and our third option is a worker biometric suit that just provides ed, uh, against more advantages to our device. So just to close up, uh, we're currently in production uh, in a, a local factory, local manufacturer. Uh, we have clinical testing done by one of the leading universities. Uh, we have two patents pending. We have recently won the National Collegiate Inventors and Innovators Alliance Award for Best Technological Innovation and Best Pitch. Uh, we've also recently won the New York State Business Plan Competition uh, and as well as the Rochester Business Plan Competition. Uh, we have customer trials with incredibly lucrative uh, customers. Uh, we have product line extensions that are going to be just as promising as our current device. And most importantly, at Strong Arm Technologies, we're creating real quality products that have real human impact. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Sean. Our last presenter in the morning session is David Knapper, President and CEO, Expose Retail Systems.
Okay, so my name is David Knapper, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about what life in my e-lane is all about. So imagine tomorrow you're headed to work, and you stop off to grab a coffee at your favorite uh, location. And this time that you show up, there's absolutely no lines. Not only is there no lines, but they just happen to be sitting there waiting for you with your order ready to go. Or imagine it's been a long day at work, you've had a long commute home, all you have to do is grab a few groceries on the way home, and this time that you show up and pull into the parking lot, they just happen to be waiting there for you. Oh, I'm sorry. They just happen to be waiting there for you to load the order into your car. Or imagine it's a Saturday, the kids have swimming class, they've got karate class, you've got a barbecue to get to later on the day, and you've got a million errands to run. And every single place that you stop off, they just happen to be waiting to give you your order. This is what life in my e-lane is all about. It's about cutting through the red tape of lines and cues and allowing you to get what you wanted to get and then just get on with life. The way we do it is we solve the root cause that ends up creating lines, thereby limiting the need for them. So let me show you what I'm talking about. Uh, from a mobile application, the customer would uh, launch our app and they would choose the merchant that they wish to purchase from before heading to the location. In this case, we'll use McDonald's as an example. They would select the location and then they would choose to create a new order. From here, they select items from a menu and then possibly get upsold at the last minute. And uh, from there, they would uh, review and confirm their order. Now, at this point, once they confirm their order, they just put their phone back in their pocket and they don't worry about it any longer. The reason they don't have to worry about it any longer is because as soon as they're on route, we begin to monitor their estimated time of arrival through the GPS function of the phone. So what that allows us now to do is to know precisely when they're going to show up and then to place the order at the store at the precise time where the order preparation will directly coincide with their arrival. So the payment happens along the way. All the customer has to do is show up with the receipt, grab their order, and go. No lines. What we've really done is created an operations tool that allows merchants of any kind to forecast imminent demand within a window of time that they choose, prepare orders in advance, and then queue those orders to meet the specific arrival sequence of the incoming customers. So by making the merchants vastly more operationally efficient, we've gotten rid of the need for lines. So customers don't have to stand in them. So this pretty much applies just about anywhere, but we do have some target markets that are uh, going out of the gate. First is quick service uh, restaurants. Primary reason is during their peak times of the day, they're actually not that quick. Wait times can be between three to five minutes, extending upwards of 10 minutes uh, at some of the more popular locations. This poses a serious constraint on potential customer throughput as well as uh, potential customer satisfaction when you're not meeting expectations. Uh, in addition to uh, uh, safety and environmental concerns, which is why a lot of municipalities in, the, in Canada and the United States are moving to ban drive throughs Our uh, product offers a very nice alternative that benefits the merchant, the consumer, the environment, and the community. So uh, online grocery shopping has never surpassed 1% uh, market penetration rate, which is shocking when you look at the fact that 50% of people don't like grocery shopping, and 80% of those people will shop online for just about anything else. The reason is, uh, it's an inflexible model. It requires you to order the day before, and then to commit the day before to a very specific time the next day to go pick it up or to accept delivery. Um, what our app does is it returns the control back to the customer and allows them the freedom to go pick it up whenever they want. All they do is they open the app, they let them know they're coming, store knows when they're on their way in, and they give them the pre-staged order. Uh, casual dining restaurants, so traditional takeout, represent the low-hanging fruit. Um, and will be the bulk of our business, especially in the first few years. Uh, what we do that's unique in this regard is we, uh, we make the order prepared based on your arrival uh, as opposed to the other way around. So our go-to-market strategy starts now while we continue or while we finish developing the product. Um, we are pre-selling the small, uh, small chains and independent merchants in our pilot region, which is the uh, Burlington, Oakville, Niagara, uh, Buffalo area. Uh, by the time we're set to launch, which is in October of this year, we expect to have at least 100 merchants on board ready to go, and then in the first 12 months expanding to about 500 merchants. Supporting that go-to-market strategy, amongst many other things, uh, will be the merchant educating their end user of the service they now provide. Uh, we're going to be launching a social media uh, campaign, but more importantly, what we've done is we built into the app a button, and what this button allows people to do is that uh, to share their experience of just having blown by the line uh, across all their social media networks uh, instantly with one push of a button. And what that will allow us to do is to leverage each and individu uh, everybody's individual contacts. Uh, that will make us go viral pretty quickly. So notable milestones, it is patent pending. Um, we've engaged uh, in some high-level conversations with some of the biggest quick service and uh, restaurants and grocery chains. The feedback has been fantastic. Um, it, the conversations are ongoing, it's a long cycle, uh, but most notably the most revered grocery retailer in the United States uh, is very enthusiastic about the potential of this. 
Uh, we've entered into two strategic agreements with gentlemen who are deeply ingrained in the grocery industry and the quick service restaurant industry. Their sole purpose is to pick up the phone and call the key decision makers at these big companies, and this has been working out fantastic. And we're only five months to a finished product. So our competitors, in the restaurant industry, there's three major players in the United States. All of these do basically the same thing and allow you to make an online order for takeout food and schedule a pickup or delivery. Uh, they've, they've really just replaced the phone call with an online presence. Um, they've all done very well though. In their first five years, they all rose to about $30 million each in revenue. They're about $100 million these days. Uh, last year, each and individual one of them uh, raised $50 million in venture capital and they're making a lot of acquisitions. So this could pose as a nice early exit strategy. In the grocery industry, we'll be competing with the local online delivery services. In the Toronto area, uh, for example, you've got Grocery Gateway, and in the States, you have uh, one example is Peapod. So our revenue model has two main components. The first is a pretty straightforward per transaction fee to the merchant. You can see that up there. But most importantly, what it is, is in our ability, the vast data collection we're doing, and in our ability to have a direct conversation with the user. One of the biggest quick service restaurants that we're talking to, this is what got them the most excited, was uh, now they'll be able to know who their customer is, what they actually buy, but then also be able to have a very direct targeted conversation with them. Um, and this doesn't limit itself to just merchants, consumer packaged goods companies as well have the ability to uh, directly talk with an end consumer. So to do our projections, I started by looking at the number of locations we can anticipate in the next five years. The way I did this was I broke down each market segment and then looked at the experience that each of our competitors had in their first five years and then pulled it back to be conservative. Uh, to get to the revenue figures, I did the same thing. I took their experience over the first five years per market segment, pulled it back to be conservative. For some reason though, when I was looking in the, the handout, uh, the figures are different. So these are the ones that you wanna, you wanna remember. So why we're here, uh, we're raising $350,000 to support the commercialization, which will start in uh, October, so this fall. That's for the marketing, the staff, the operations, uh, business development. Uh, we expect this to be cash positive within the first 12 months. Moving forward, looking forward, as soon as we launch, we're gonna wanna start thinking about version 2.0, so with the enhanced features. Uh, so basically about six months after we launch, we're gonna start development on that. Uh, then moving beyond there, after the first 12 months of our launch, we're going to want to start looking into at least three new major markets. And then along the way, we're going to capture uh, one of the large franchises, and uh, that comes with a cost for integration and support at that point. So I wanted to conclude just with a thought of the difference between value versus revenue. I mean, we're all familiar with the, uh, likely, with the, uh, the recent acquisition of Instagram. Uh, $1 billion acquisition with zero revenue. Uh, but I want to use a different example, which is Foursquare. So if you're not familiar with this company, what they do is they're a mobile application that allows you to check into all the different places that you either buy stuff from or you visit. And in exchange for doing that, they give you points, status, uh, and deals from those different places. Uh, this company started in 2009. They have about 10 million users <clears throat> and are currently around a $600 million valuation. The, this valuation is not driven by the revenue, it's driven by the fact of the number of users they have, the data they're collecting, and their ability to communicate directly with these people. The best part is, what they're doing, we're automatically doing by actually providing a value-added service to the customer that enhances their lives, because they never stand in lines ever again. So when you buy something, you're checking into that place. And unlike Foursquare, we actually know what you're buying. So our data integrity goes, goes much higher. So it's just food for thought. Um, the question is, what is our value when we have our two million users, which is our target by five years? And I'm just gonna end on that one. So thank you very much.